Hello, and, and welcome to this short uh, video presentation, just as an introduction to uh, William Shakespeare and the world in which he grew up and created his art. I'm aware, uh, I'm a high school English teacher, and I'm aware that there's a lot of traps to fall into with introductory videos like this. I'm aware of the limitations I have. So to explain or even introduce Shakespeare in a video presentation, it could be 10,000 slides long. So I've tried to reduce it to 10 facts about him and his world that I think are, you don't necessarily need to know to read the plays. I'm very honest with my students about that. But I'm also aware that different people enter literature differently. Some people, it's really helpful for them to know little historical facts. Some people are fascinated by the biography of a writer or what the author believed religiously or philosophically. Um, some people like to know the historical context uh, water cooler talk of the day. So there'll be little tidbits uh, of those kinds of pieces of information in this presentation. I hope it's helpful. First, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, Shakespearean actors in England used to dread when Churchill, uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill was in attendance at, at the theater because he often had a, he always had a good seat, right, as the Prime Minister. And there were many plays of Shakespeare that he knew by heart, including the four great tragedies of, of Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, and Othello. So actors tell that he would be mumbling lines for two or three hours. In uh, 1964 at the Democratic National Convention, um, Robert F. Kennedy spoke. He had lost his brother on November 22nd, 1963. And he was urging the the convention that they they will look back and, and miss those they've lost, like his brother, but they have to look forward. And in trying to capture the sentiment of how he felt regarding his brother, he quotes Juliet's lines shortly after she meets Romeo. She says this quotation, when he shall die, cut him into little stars, and he shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will fall in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Shakespeare even had a part to play in, in the discussions after uh, September 11th, 2001, when a US Senator wanted words solemn enough to match the occasion of September 11th, 2001, and the terrorist attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Centers. Uh, he reached for Shakespeare's play, The Comedy of Errors, and um, in a moving speech you can access in the congressional record, he says the, the quote from Comedy of Errors, grief hath changed me since you saw me last. Grief hath changed me since you saw me last. And then he continued, we are all changed. Yesterday changed us all. One of the reasons that's often given for why we pay more attention to Shakespeare than any any other writer in the English language. One of the reasons is that he seems to have the perfect expression of every human feeling and thought. So when Romeo goes to meet Rosalind at the at the party and he sees Juliet for the first time, he doesn't say, wow, she's really beautiful. He says, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. And in Coriolanus, which I think is an underrated play, uh, he perfectly captures the idea of making fun of somebody. More of your conversation would infect my brain. And then the famous ending of the Tomorrow, Tomorrow uh, monologue or soliloquy in Macbeth in Act 5 after he finds out that his wife has died. It concludes with life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Uh, I think of all the people uh, this year who lost loved ones to COVID. And that this exact sentence in a variety of sort of variations, this exact sentiment lived in the hearts of thousands of people. Um, as, as you probably know, Juliet uh, falls in love with Romeo and Juliet is of the Capulet family, Rome, Romeo of the Montague family, the rival families that come to blows in the streets with each other and have despised each other for generations. And Juliet, always way more philosophical and sort of on the ball than Romeo, immediately digs to the philosophical and asks, what does my identity, what is my identity comprised of? Is it my name? 
And she says, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Uh, early in Henry IV, part two, we have the perfect expression of why it's difficult to be an authority, to be a boss. Uh, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. The most famous expression in English of being confused, uh, from my own part, it was Greek to me, from Julius Caesar. Um, I think of the January 6th uh, insurrections um, at Congress this year, and I thought of this line from The Tempest, hell is empty and all the devils are here. Then we have Hamlet talking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern when um, Hamlet says he's in prison and they're looking at him confused because he's the prince of this great kingdom. He lives in a castle. And they said, we think not so, my lord. And uh, after saying some other things, Hamlet says this line, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison, he says. And then the most famous expression of being short in English literature from Midsummer Night's Dream, though she be but little, she is fierce. There is Denzel ready for our presentation. Okay, so again, 10 facts. If you're a student of mine, I would just have something written down for each slide, okay? First, just to get our historical bearings, he's born a few years after Elizabeth I reign begins. He's born April 23rd, 1564. Uh, April 23rd is the feast day of St. George, a uh, famous saint who slayed the dragon and um, patron saint of England. So um, it almost as if the gods wanted Shakespeare to be the national poet because he's born on St. George's Day in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon. Then uh, I want to talk a little bit about this. I wanted to, to pepper in some nuggets that you might not know. Um, he had an unusual resume for a playwright, a playwright of his day. Um, as I discuss in my uh, Elizabethan theater video that, uh, and I think in this video later as well, that most of the people that wrote plays uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries were university educated and Shakespeare wasn't. Shakespeare went to the Stratford Grammar School right here. And what did he study as a, as a tiny boy? He studied Latin grammar. There was no science class. Uh, he didn't learn how to play the violin. Uh, there was no gym. He didn't have to run laps. Uh, there was no math. He learned Latin grammar. He learned little Latin tags when he was a tiny, tiny guy. He learned how to decline verbs and he learned vocabulary. Um, he eventually learned uh, rhetoric. This is uh, really, really important. In Utramque uh, Partem is the fancy way of saying learning how to take both sides of an argument. Learning how to take both sides of an argument. And whether you've read Shakespeare, seen him or not, what you see that is really new in Shakespeare, he doesn't that maybe doesn't invent this idea, but he perfects it is the idea that he doesn't simply show us characters' thoughts, what they think. He actually shows us characters thinking in real time, wrestling with their problems in real time out loud. And it often has to do with um, thinking one opinion and then imagining the opposite. In fact, it seems to me that Shakespeare's default setting is having a thought and immediately imagining if the opposite were true, to be or not to be. That is the question. Um, and then uh, something that's interesting, and I'll skip ahead really quickly, is uh, he also would study in, in Latin what was called uh, copia, which is just the ability to write in an in infinite number of ways in an infinite number of styles. So for example, um, Erasmus imagines this, this would have been in Latin as well. Your letter pleased me greatly. And the challenge to the students would be how many different ways you can see it. So, write that. So, I mean, your letter mightily pleased me. To a wonderful degree did your letter please me. And then go to the top of the second page. Once I had read your affectionate letter, I was carried away with a strange happiness. Go to the bottom. At the sight of your letter, the frown fled from my mind's brow. So students were encouraged to learn how to say things, not just 
not to, not to be redundant, but because there was a, re, a rhetorical awareness that how we say things is as important as what we're saying. Which words do we land on most strongly? How, you know, how do we organize? One thing about studying Latin that Shakespeare learned is that you know in Latin you can kind of move words around and have the sentence mean the same thing. But if you land, say, on the verb at the end of the sentence, um, that verb can have a different weight to it. And Shakespeare learned that. So you can tell these all feel very differently. So that was a big thing Shakespeare learned. But he stopped at the end of grammar school, right, as a younger teenager. And he became an apprentice for his father, who was a glover or a maker of gloves, kind of a smelly blue collar job, you know, tanning hides, animal hides and stuff like that. So we had this classical grammar school education, and then he worked with the public. And any of you that have worked retail, who've worked with the public, know that you learn as much about human nature working retail than you do from books, if not more, right? So I just think that's, um, that's it's a really interesting uh, resume. So, uh, I'm skipping a lot. Um, in 1582, he's 18 years old. He marries Anne Hathaway. And I say that to my students, and I always remind them it isn't the movie star, uh, Anne Hathaway. Um, one wonders whether that movie star would have been attracted to Shakespeare, maybe. Uh, who could resist him? Um, she was four months along with his child. Evidently, that wasn't, I was reading about this, that wasn't overly unusual. People cohabitating and conceiving children shortly before they were married. Um, we know very little about their domestic uh, situation. Shakespeare didn't leave behind diaries, letters. So he himself, as you'll see, is, is a mystery. But anyway, he was married and they started a family relatively soon after. Something I want to discuss isn't simply Shakespeare's theater, which I'm going to discuss in a separate video in greater detail, but that the world he's in is theatrical. So I'm going to discuss a few separate points about the theater of, of the Elizabethan and later the Jacobean world. So first of all, you'll notice this is the uh, Lord Mayor of London. He has the mayoral chain. Um, look how happy he looks having this position. <laughs> um, maybe if you have this uncomfortable collar, that would be your default face. Um, and then here you have a modern film version of, of what Queen Elizabeth may have looked like clearly. Um, there's a theatricality to authority now, right? It, think about dressing up for meetings. Um, those of us who have been on Zoom are re-entering the world now. And it's just strange, you know, wearing actual clothes, right? Um, so the, the royalty uh, wore these special clothes and you had to be, and I'm forgetting what it is, but you had, even had to be a certain rank in royalty to wear certain colors like purple, for example. And people went to the theater sometimes, you know, to see the costumes, to see colors they normally wouldn't see in their lives. The Anglican Church, the Church of England, also has uh, its own, like all major religions do, its own theatricality, right? The vestments are, are designed in a particular way. The sort of theatrical blocking of the liturgy is done in a certain way. Um, there's, call, there's, there's an audience, there's a, a stage of sorts, you know, behind the altar. So the Anglican Church has its theatricality. Uh, and then uh, you have um, the street jugglers that were everywhere. You have, which there's a theatricality to that. And also the theatricality of, you know, the stage of a bear baiting pit where you chain a bear to the wall, he's rabid and crazy and hungry, and they sick some dogs on him, and you bet on either the dogs or the bear, and there's a crowd. So more theatricality. And then kind of morbid, but, but real, that public executions were entertainment as well. You would bring your family to see presumably guilty people hanged. And that was considered, um, that was considered an entertainment. And then something that never gets discussed is why was it the perfect time for Shakespeare to go to London to start a theatrical life? Well, for those who are watching, who are thinking about going to college soon, some of you are going to apply to colleges that are in college towns like South Bend, Indiana, or 
you know, where Duke University is or um, Amherst, Massachusetts, where UMass Amherst is. And college towns often have very vibrant art scenes because they have a young population. Well, half of the London population when Shakespeare was young was under 20 years old. Life expectancy was in the 40s, but it was a population ready for the arts, ready for reinvention of something like theater. So I think that's really, really interesting and important. Okay. Something that gets discussed a lot that frankly, I feel like I have to address, but to me is the least interesting about thing about Shakespeare is whether or not Shakespeare, who is a man that we know existed, we have his name on various legal documents, we know this, but there's some debate, not in my head, but there's some debate as to whether William Shakespeare, the man we know historically, whether he wrote the plays that we now ascribe to William Shakespeare. And then the lost years where we kind of lose track of Shakespeare, he leaves Stratford-on-Avon and his wife and family to go to London, which was very unusual for a man to do. And he does it. He had a purpose, evidently. But we don't know how he goes from grammar school working on a Glover's to being the most famous playwright in the world. We don't, we don't know the process by which he does that. Some people think he took, he, was, he took care of the horses of people outside the theater and got to know the acting group. Some people actually think he went into the Navy. Uh, some people think he went to the university and then we have no records of that. So that's ridiculous to me. Um, we actually don't know. And, and I don't know, I just think that's really interesting. Secondly, really, really important. Um, there's a couple, if you study English seriously, two of the eras, two of the sort of categories of English literature are named after its greatest monarchs, Elizabethan literature, and Victorian literature for Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901. Um, the two monarchs that were alive and ruled during Shakespeare's life was Queen Elizabeth. She ruled from 1558, uh, shortly before Shakespeare was born, to 1603, when he was sort of in the peak of his career. She was the daughter of the Protestant Anne Boleyn, uh, daughter of uh, daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. When she died in 1603, King James uh, of Scotland, uh, this was her cousin, um, became King James of England. He reigned from 1603 to 1625. He was the son of the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots and, like I said, cousin of Queen Elizabeth. Um, there's a lot of interesting, interesting nuggets here. Um, first of all, I think one of the things that's just interesting to bear in mind is that it's really hard to figure out what Shakespeare thinks. Um, the more I read him, the more I'm not sure about who he is. He seems to disappear within the plays and he can take on the voice of various people. And when he does that, he seems to express a lot of, you know, doubt, you know, characters, not sure what to do, not sure of who they are, uh, not sure of what to believe. Right. We think of the beginning of Hamlet and, is this a real ghost or not? Uh, what does my faith require of me? And it's interesting to, to note that in his early life, England had been through, you know, Henry VIII, who went from Catholic to Protestant, Henry VIII's son, who was very briefly king, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, brought back Catholicism, Queen Elizabeth, um, a little more diplomatic, but very Protestant. Um, and there was a lot of sort of removal of Catholic iconography from churches, Catholic images from churches, but a lot of people would just sort of gently whitewash them, not paint over them because they actually weren't sure, you know, if the next King would be Catholic or the next queen be Catholic. So it was a world very much on quicksand, um, in what it believed and who it was particularly religiously. And I think that uncertainty is really, really dramatized in Shakespeare in really interesting ways. Um, so I just think that's, uh, that's curious. Um, we know that he had to, and we'll get to this later in greater detail, who the king, who the monarch was really mattered. You had to sort of play games and do and say the right things. This was not an era where you had free speech. There wasn't a Saturday Night Live in Elizabethan or Jacobean England where you could, you know, like we did with, you know, Clinton and Bush and Trump, 
um, make fun of the president on TV. You couldn't do that. So, so we'll learn. Shakespeare had to be very aware of how he thought out loud about things. So what did he write? He wrote mainly histories, comedies, tragedies, and he also wrote a couple of really famous lyric poems and 154 sonnets. Um, this is uh, Kenneth Branagh as Henry V, which is a great film version of that play. This is uh, Bottom turning into the donkey in Midsummer Night's Dream. And this is David Tennant in Act 5, Scene 1 of, of Hamlet staring into, staring into Yorick's skull, his foster father in a way. Um, so uh, curiously, Shakespeare wrote about 36 plays, which was a lot. So many plays of the era are lost, and Shakespeare's, from what we know, aren't. Uh, a couple of later plays that we think he may be involved in have, have gone missing, but his works has survived. So, relatively, uh, well, in the late 15, early 1600s, the Lord Chamberlain sponsored Shakespeare's acting troops. They became the Lord Chamberlain's men. And um, right around 1599, they moved uh, one theater called The Theater. I'll talk about that in my other video. They moved all the pieces of that theater across the Thames to the South Bank, and they built this theater, the Globe Theater. This is a, uh, the recent version of it, the original burned down. And uh, it's obviously outside. And I'm gonna talk in my Elizabethan theater video in greater detail about the space itself. Um, but, you know, Shakespeare uh, had a group of players that he wrote exclusively for, and sort of like a, a team of veteran athletes, they could read each other's minds, learn quickly, read each other really well. And he had a regular theater space that he was part owner of, and he had a regular group of men that would work with him. Now, Neologisms is a fancy way of saying new word, an invented new word. We think, various estimates on this, that Shakespeare used 31,534 different words in his body of work. And that 1,700 of them, give or take, were his invention. My students always ask, how do you invent a word? Well, you have to make it stick. Right, it has to make sense to a large group of people, and they have to use it over and over again. So, all the bold-faced words in this little anecdote, a series of questions, all these bold-faced words are Shakespeare's invention. Let's say an alligator hurried downstairs to your bedroom. What if you read some gossip with your eyeball on Twitter about two friends of yours kissing? What if you were questioning two of your lonely friends about it? Would you begin to rant? or show your swag and stay strong. And lastly, uh, the authorship controversy and his death. He dies, we think, on his birthday, April 23rd, uh, 1616. And um, this is the epitaph that he wrote for himself. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he who moves my bones. Um, my, I have this in my room, and my students always ask about it. Spelling wasn't made regular until Samuel Johnson's dictionary in the 18th century, and it really wasn't regular until after that. Shakespeare signs his name um, six or seven different ways. Um, sometimes we think in the same day. So... Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, the authorship controversy, I would rather spend time watching his plays and less time wondering about the biography of who wrote them. Um, but it is it is interesting that we have very little, uh, we have nothing of the private man and lots about the public man. Um, but he dies in 1616, reinvents literature in uh, infinite ways. He reinvents what characters can do. He reinvents what theater can do, um, and he seems equally comfortable retelling historical moments, creating fantasy landscapes, creating great tragic heroes. He seems just equally comfortable um, in 
any kind of world. But anyway, I hope these uh, I hope these these little notes are helpful to you, and good luck with your Shakespeare reading and viewing.